don't look at this video as obviously sexual orientation. Oh, morning. But to properly lay the groundwork for this topic, first I have to do a run through of Emile Durkheim's most influential book, which focuses on an entirely different topic. And when I say run through, I mean just enough of a quick overview so that you'll have a bare bones understanding of his methodology. The first part of this video then is akin to scaffolding. I'll let you know here in a couple of you when I get to the main building itself. In other words, when I start describing that third possibility that is in the title of this video. Okay, so here we go. Very quick detour. Emile Durkheim, among other things, was a famous French statistician. He happened across a negative phenomenon that was becoming much more prevalent. While occurrences of this heinous, tragic activity had remained fairly stagnant between 1500 and 1820, occurrences had tripled between 1820 and 1880. Searching for answers to the questions, why did it triple and why so quickly? Durkheim interviewed a wide variety of professionals, law enforcement officials, psychologists, clergy, coroners, historians, and he found that their theories or proposed solutions or commentary were about as diverse as possible, and ultimately, for his purposes, unreliable. Law enforcement officials, for instance, they're interested because this negative phenomenon involves a crime. Thing is, though, by the time they catch this particular criminal, he's already dead. So punishment isn't really going to help. I mean, your arm just gets tired, you know, from the spanking. But, but don't get me wrong. Punishment is great, but so is prevention. One of the hallmarks of prevention, as it differs from punishment, say, when it pertains to a crime like murder, is that you, the would-be victim, you get the added bonus of still being alive. I mean, ooh, 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 ooh. I mean, if that's what you want to be, alive. And I'm not being sarcastic or flippant here either. What all with Durkheim's book being titled Suicide, which compares to murder, obviously. You've got dead people in both situations. But it's different, too, in at least one very significant way, the prevention angle. What Durkheim found was that despite the preventative efforts of various governments throughout history, which included taking inheritances away from the rightful heirs and not allowing those who committed suicide to be buried in the more honored cemeteries, despite those and other law enforcement tactics, nothing worked. But now, what? what, what? I hear, is that dissent? Do I hear pointed and accusatory questions? Oh, hold on a second. Let me explain. Suicide is scaffolding. Today, for this video, suicide is part of the scaffolding. It's not my main topic. Please, let's not be connecting the dots ahead of time. Yes, yes, gays commit suicide. But, you know, every demographic have committed suicide. Except for babies. I am not going to be drawing any causal arrows between the concepts of gays and suicide anywhere in this video. Nothing implied, nothing, nothing at all. I'm just trying to show the methods that Durkheim developed. And admittedly, his topic is a little morbid, a little serious, you know. It, it's his topic is here, and his methodology or his methods are like here. And, and what we're looking at, what I'm trying to do is show you his methods. His topic is almost immaterial, really. Anyway, time to get back on track. Okay, so Durkheim, trying to answer his two questions, why the tripling and why so quickly, chose to concentrate on just the raw stats. What he found was that if a nation went to war, and this would be a local or localized war, like our civil war, that suicides in that nation decreased an average of 32%. He proposed that many citizens of that nation first grew ever fearful of dying in that war, and then two, reacted to their fears by linking arms, so to speak, with their fellow citizens. 
Many who, under other circumstances, arguably, and I'll get into those arguments in a sec, many who arguably would have committed suicide ended up staying alive because they felt as though their neighbors needed them to, you know, work in munitions plants or fire guns at the enemy or help in the war effort however they could. Subtotaling war commences and suicide drops 32%. And this was the average decrease for all of Europe for the entire 19th century. So we're not talking about a fluke here. The professor was not describing some lark, some random stat that showed up once in a while. Durkheim uh, also found that suicide increased 34% if a nation plunged into an economic depression. This again was the average increase for all 19th century European nations. Speculation as to why suicides increased during an economic depression can be typed up down there in the comment section. Now, what would happen, Durkheim asked, if first one and then the other of these two phenomena occurred back to back? Which has happened few times in Durkheim's day and before. But more importantly, it also happened after 1917, which is the year Durkheim died. In other words, prediction. Durkheim, in effect, predicted what this 20 would look like. Hopefully one of those views will work for you. Anyway, this is from this is from datamarket.com, link in the linky place, and it depicts American suicide rates from 1920 to 1969. Note, top of this mountain here, that's 1932, a couple years into the Great Depression, well, the first Great Depression. As the world's economy righted itself and then World War II kicked into gear, notice this precipitous fall. Here, the Nader, are the years 1942 and 1943, pretty much the middle of that war. <coughs> supposed to use the sneeze button. Excuse me. Durkheim found that during an economic depression, a nation's suicides would climb to 134% of its normal or usual rate. As that nation's economy righted itself and then became involved in a localized war, its suicide rate would fall to 68% of normal. 134 reduced by 49.5% equals 68. I'm rounding 49.5 to 50. 50 is half. So when a person points a gun at his or her own head and that gun goes off, in other words, the medical examiner confirms that it was indeed a suicide, how many fingers were on the trigger of that gun? Durkheim concludes, if there's no local war and there is an economic depression afoot, that half the time others helped this person pull that trigger. I'm going to switch gears again. No more suicidal scaffolding. Here we go. Main topic. Sexual orientation. Some fundamentalists give me the impression that they, fundamentalists, think that since certain people choose to live in a way that the good book poo-poos, that it is not crossing the line for these fundamentalists to murder them, or to, in effect, conspire to murder them. Quote, do not blame us, these fundamentalists say, if we defend ourselves against the harm that your lifestyle choices have unleashed upon all humanity. End quote. Now, if there's one aspect of this video I wish viewers would take home with them today, it's that I am losing my account. Excuse me. If there's one aspect of this video I wish viewers would take home with them today, it's that I am not engaging in hyperbole with that quote, especially if you consider those from Topeka, Kansas, who attend the Westboro Baptist Church and at funerals of fallen soldiers hold up signs that say God hates so and those and I will not repeat their word because I don't want to be quoted out of context just google it eh. 
So let me get this straight. I gotta hold it right now. But these people can talk you into killing yourself when it suits them. And they can talk you out of killing yourself when it suits them. But they can't talk you into, for instance, leaving the playground, you know, when you were a kid? Really? They can't? Only us popular kids get to play on a jungle gym. You are the outcast. Quote, unquote. This was overheard at recess, and then an emotionally hurt child shuffled his feet and ambled over to the corner by the drinking fountain. Later, another child also gets ostracized. You smell. Go away. So this second child also shambles away. Shambles over to the corner. Now there are two kids by the drinking fountain, and they are the same gender. Then, as these developing humans continue to attempt to avoid pain, which is to say, they attempt to stay in that corner, to stay away from those who would tease and taunt them, and as they attempt to seek pleasure, well, one thing leads to another. I think fundamentalists, or whoever, are wrong when they promote or promulgate the idea that since certain consenting adults choose to engage in non-heterosexual acts that are nonetheless sexual and with each other and in the privacy of their own homes, that it's okay to murder them. But just because these fundamentalists are wrong about the murder part, and they very well could be wrong about the choice part, that doesn't make others correct, necessarily, when these others say that choice has nothing to do with it. The people are just born the way they're born. I mean, these born that way advocates might be half right or three quarters right, or even 100% correct about some people being born gay. Regardless, I think there's a third possibility. Maybe other people get talked into it. I mean, they can talk you into killing yourself, but they can't talk you into going gay? Really? I'm not going to say how. I mean, my playground example is obviously a metaphor, a strained metaphor, a, a very, very incomplete metaphor. And then also I think it's pretty common that many gays claim to have known they were gay since like age four or five. Fine. Whatever. Good for them. I wasn't born at age four. I was born at age zero. There's a lot that can happen in those first few formative years. A lot that gays don't have the definitive answers on, and straights don't either. And scientists don't either. Don't let them kid you. They wore lab coats, and they got clipboards, but that still doesn't mean they know what they're talking about as far as this subject is concerned. So, wrapping things up. I really don't think I could ever do justice to Emile Durkheim's findings. I mean, he basically put the word science into the term social science. He legitimized sociology. I highly recommend his book, Suicide. But if reading 400 plus pages of something that was published over a century ago doesn't sound very appetizing, you might choose instead to view videos 10 through 20 of my YouTube series affectionately known as The Woman with 1.5 Hands. Those 11 short films are the Durkheimian parts of that series. Now, even though they're mostly about Durkheim, they do not touch on today's topic at all. So, there you have it.